Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to appreciate you being here this morning and visiting with each other. I love that sound. I, I like that you like each other. Come on in. Get a seat. The better ones are closer, down here toward the front. The better seats are down here at the front. Come on down. Appreciate you being here. As we gather for worship, whether you joined us online or in person this morning, we appreciate you so, so much. I'll read a passage from, as we get started, from 1 Kings. This is 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah is uh, being chased. He has just experienced one of the great miracles in all the Bible. And yet, because of that, uh, Jezebel uh, puts a hit out on Elijah. And he is running for his life. He is depressed and he is discouraged. In fact, he says that I'm the only one. And the Lord comes to him and reminds him, you're not the only one. He says, I'm the only one left, and they seek my life to take it. The Lord reminds them, not only are you not the only one, there are thousands like you. And I want to remind you, you're not the only one either that love the Lord and are worshiping him this morning in spirit and truth. We're not alone. We're part of a big family from all over the world that is worshiping uh, our Lord together. That We've come for that specific uh, blessing this morning to worship him in spirit and in truth. But after that, Elijah goes and he finds Elisha. Elisha would become one of the great prophets and he would pass literally a mantle toward Elijah, from Elijah to Elisha. And the Bible tells us in verse 19, and so he departed from there and found Elisha the son of Shaphat while he was plowing with 12 pairs of oxen before him and he was with the twelfth, and Elijah passed over to him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I'll follow you. And he said to them, Go back again, for what have I done for you? And so were returned following him, and he took a pair of oxen, and he sacrificed them, and boiled their flesh and implements on the oxen. And he gave it to the people to eat, and he arose and followed Elijah, and he ministered to him. In February of 1519, a Spanish explorer of the name of Cortez set out for Mexico. He had an entourage of some 11 ships and 13 horses and 110 sailors, some 553 soldiers. The indigenous population on arrival was somewhere around 5 million at the time. From a mathematical standpoint, what Cortez was facing was 7,500 41 to 1 odds. There had been already several expeditions to what they called the New World and they had failed and yet Cortez would conquer most of the South American continent. What Cortez did and on the landing is really an epic tale of uh, mythic proportions and if you know the story of Cortez, when he landed on the shores he issued an order that the ships that they came in would be burned. And so it was an all-or-nothing task. Cortez ordered the ships to be burned. His crews and the soldiers watched as the ships burned and sank. And there was no plan B. They realized that they were going to fight. There was no flight. They were going to survive or they would not accomplish their task. And so Cortez took away the option to go back, to go back home. I, th I think in a spiritual sense, we do that. We need to do that, to have no plan B. That there's a plan A, and that is that we burn some things, we, we put some things out of our past, we take some things out of our minds, out of our homes, and we burn the ships maybe of past failures and past success and bad habits, the ships of regret, the ships of name guilt, the ships of an old way of life. I think that's what Cortez did, and that's what Elijah did and Elisha would eventually do. You realize that Elisha took the oxen that he was plowing with and the implements of the plow and he broke them apart 
and he barbecued the animals and the plows themselves, literally saying, I am never coming back to this job again. It was the last day that, that Elisha would be a farmer, and it would be the first day that he would be a prophet and begin to serve Elisha. I think we need to do that in our own life, and maybe this morning there's some things you need to let go of. Have, quit going back to a plan B or a plan C. That you want to serve the Lord with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your soul. That you'll have him in front of you, and especially this morning as we worship him in spirit and truth, that you will, you will put some things behind you. I think that's how you break addictions. It's how you reconcile relationship. You leave the past in the past, and you burn some ships, and you leave it behind. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful today for your love for us, and we're thankful for the privilege we have to worship you today in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Lord, for every soul present and every soul that will gather and watch this service online. We're thankful for those that will participate in this service as we meet around your table, as we sing praises to you, that we realize this morning and recognize that you are the audience. We're not the audience. You are the audience of our worship. And as, we, uh, as you examine our hearts, that you would find us all in, somewhat like Elisha so long ago, that we have left our past, that we have left uh, the, the sin and the regret and all of that behind us, and that we are, we are adventuring into a new way of life. And especially this morning, our minds and our souls, our hearts are open and as we listen to your word, as we are challenged by the words of the songs we're going to sing, as we meet around your table and think about what you did for us so long ago at the sacrifice at the cross at Calvary, Father, may we not leave here the same people that walked in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. If it's uh, convenient for you, we'll stand for our first song. Holy Lord, most holy Lord, you alone are worthy of my praise. Oh, holy Lord, most holy Lord, with all of my heart I sing, with my heart I sing, great are you, Lord, worthy of praise. Holy 
Let's go to God in prayer. Dear God, as we come to you in prayer, Father, we're so thankful to be here today. We're so thankful to be able to come together as a family that worships here at Snellville. Father, we come to you to give thanks to you, thanking you for sending your son. Father, we are humble, and Father, we are a people that are broken and know we need you and know that you are our only hope. Father, we pray that our minds will be cleared of all the distractions, of all the things that are outside. Focus in on the songs that are being sung. Focus in on the message that will be shared. And Father, when that opportunity comes and we are able to, to, to fellowship with one another, help us to seek out one another, to be able to talk to one another, get in each other's lives, and to just to be able to offer just that word of advice, a word of help, and just comfort one another. <coughs> Father, there are many that are on our list that are sick and shut in, that are hurting. Help us to reach out to them. Help us to be a congregation that looks around our section of where we sit at and those that are missing that are not here. Help us to reach out to them this week and to just to see how things are going. Father, this time, let us be the family, a family here at Snellville that looks after one another, where that others will see us, that, will, that others will see you in us and ask, and, and ask that question for us to be prepared to answer. We thank you for your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Encamped along the hills of life, ye Christian souls to cry and press the time here you come on a good morning i want to tell you we we're, we're offering a lunch today and we're going to do this a couple of times in the next few months and uh, you just happen to come on the right sunday some people have been barbecuing and cooking chicken and green beans and baked beans and i've been slaving over a hot stove just so you could have a good lunch today and uh, so uh, our, our uh, group, the house, uh, us and the house uh, together, and of course, uh, the Wolver, our song leader, his group, he and Lee.
Lisa and their group, we're combining. We're going to have our small group next door in the fellowship hall. We just want to invite anybody that's uh, visiting here. Uh, maybe you want to know a little something more about small groups. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to you about that. But we're just going to eat and have a good time. And uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate you so much being here. I'm in the Old Testament this morning. I'm in 2 Samuel 23. If you know your Bible, 2 Samuel 23, you'll find the last words or the last song they call it of David. And along with it, there is the exploits of the mighty men. Some of the great men that uh, served David uh, when he was uh, king of Israel. David had some men. If, in fact, if they were not written in the Bible, you would not believe what is written about these guys. You would say there's no way they would have accomplished this. There's no way they would do what the Bible says they have done. But you'll see it in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 23, the deeds of the mighty men. There's a list of them, some 37 of them. There were three that were the main uh, mighty men. There were another 30. There were some uh, uh, others that are, I'm going to talk about one this morning. He wasn't really one of the three, but he was one of the great mighty men of David. His name is Benaniah. Benaniah becomes the bodyguard of King David, and later on he would become uh, second only to Solomon, the king of Israel. He would be in charge of his army. Benaniah would, uh, would do some of the great things that we'll read about this morning in the Bible, and he was one of the great soldiers in, in all of the Old, Old Testament. On September the 11th, 2001, I, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, four airplanes were hijacked by terrorists bent on evil. Uh, so last Sunday was the, the, uh, the anniversary of that date, and there were many things on television about it. You know, two planes hit the Twin Towers in New York City, another plane crashed in the field in a township outside of Pennsylvania, but one of those planes crashed into the Pentagon. And the most secure place up until that time in 2001, it was noted as probably one of the most secure facilities on the face of the earth, the Pentagon. But on that day, it was not secure anymore because a plane took out the lives of, of many people and those buildings, like many of the buildings in New, New York, those buildings, the Pentagon, they were burning. And along with all the heroes that are named, those that ran into buildings, you know, everybody's trying to get, you try to get out of a burning building, but these guys, firemen and policemen and, and uh, first responders, they're running into buildings that are collapsing and are on fire, and it was no different at the Pentagon, just like in New York City. And there was a, 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 a man, but Anderson, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ted Anderson, who was at the Pentagon when it happened, and he left his office when he heard the noise and the fire alarms went off and he went outside and he saw the devastation. And almost immediately he acted like the soldier that he was. This is an account that captures a little bit of what he did. Anderson acted like a man possessed, it said. As others ran for their lives, he sprinted from his office toward the point of impact spreading his jacket over shards of glass on a windowsill, Anderson and a non-commissioned officer by the name of Chris Brahman boost him into a collapsing building. Together they carried out two women, one of them unconscious, the other one badly burned. Over the next hour, the rest of the world would look on in shock and horror and Ted Anderson would return over and over into the blaze at the Pentagon. At one point, he and Brahman were, they were literally crawling on their bellies through one of the buildings in the Pentagon and they were yelling above the roar trying to get the attention of people that may have been injured or left behind in those buildings. And finally, Arlington firefighters would not allow them to go back into the building. They had gone into the building so many times that they would not allow them to go back into the building. They said it was unsafe and they actually saved their lives because five minutes later, those same buildings that they were crawling through collapsed and so was the day of Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson. Ted Anderson stayed there all day long, in part because his keys were still on his desk inside the Pentagon. And at the end of the day, the building superintendent allowed him to go in and get his keys, and he drove home, and he listened to 52 messages on his answering machine. 
He took a shower and he cried for something like 25 or 30 minutes and then he tried to get some sleep. The phone rang and it was his boss and he said, I can't sleep, let's go to work. And he said, I want you to put on your battle uniform. And so they got up in the middle of the night and they headed back to the Pentagon because they knew they were at war. That's what soldiers do, by the way. That's what soldiers are. If you want to understand David's mighty men, um, you have to understand a little of what drives people like Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson run back into the Pentagon over and over and over again. These were Ted's words. He said, and I quote, we had people inside. It's the nature of a military guy that we would never leave anyone ever behind. So David's mighty men were these kind of men. They weren't the kind of people that would run away from a fire, run away from the roar of the flames. They were not the kind of men that would run away from things they were afraid of. They were boot camp uh, t trained and battle tested men. You'll read about one in just a minute. These were the brave hearts of the Old Testament. Their stories, I think, are some of the most epic. In a few weeks, Lord willing, I'm going to talk about Joshev. He faced 800 to 1 odds. I can't even imagine, can you? An army of 800 people and you're standing against them. 800 to 1 odds. He stood his ground. Eleazar, the Bible says, fought until his hand froze to the sword. And when the rest of the army retreated, there is a man by the name of Shama, one of the great mighty men. And he stood, the Bible says, his ground on a small field of lentils. And this brings us to a guy by the name of Benaniah. Now we're in 2 Samuel chapter 23 this morning in verses 20 and following. And the Bible says there was also Benaniah, the son of Josheba, a valiant warrior of Kazibiel. And he, would have, he did many heroic deeds, including killing two champions of Moab. Another time on a snowy day, he chased a lion into a pit and killed it. Once armed only with a club, he killed an opposing Egyptian war, warrior who ar was armed with a spear. Benaniah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benanias as famous as the three mightiest warriors. He was honored more than the other members of the 30, though he was not one of the three. David made him captain of his bodyguard. One of the great challenges that we face when you hear a story like this is that we're kind of Monday morning quarterbacks, aren't we? Um, we know how the outcome of this story. The Bible says Ben and I had chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day. There's a guy by the name of Mark Batterson who many years ago wrote a book in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. And then years later, he would follow it up with another book entitled Chase the Lion, which um, are very in encouraging, inspirational books. I get the idea from this lesson from one of those books in particular. But it's what psychologists call hindsight bias. In other words, we know how it's going to turn out. We know that when Noah is building an ark, we know that he's going to save his family. We know that David, when he goes into battle and he has a slingshot, he's going to win over Goliath. We know Sarah, even though she's old and has no children and she is barren, will give birth to Isaac. And we know, uh, we know that Benaniah, will, he'll come out on, on top. It's, it's, a little like, it's a little like this morning talking about the football games that happened yesterday or last week, right? Um, there's no surprise anymore. Uh, the element of risk is totally taken out of it. You know, all the upsets that, uh, that took place, they've already taken place. We're going to talk about those things where it's hindsight bias. It's already taken place. We already know the outcome, and so there's no element of surprise. No risk of danger, no element uh, literally of risk at all. And so it takes away the emotion when you hear about chasing a lion into a pit on a snowy day. It has to be one of the craziest acts of courage that I've ever read about in the Bible. And I think especially today in the world we're living in, you and I need some encouragement. That's what you do, by the way, and I've said this so many times, when you encourage someone, you open them up and you put courage in them. And when you discourage someone, you open them up and you remove courage from them. Y'all, we need, especially as God's people, to be instilled with courage today. And I think it comes 
from the word of God and the power of God, and God could do that, I think, through even the story of Benaniah. I don't know what Benaniah was doing that day. Don't know where he was going. Don't know what his, his, uh, his itinerary was for the day when he ran into a lion on a snowy day. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever been around lions. Um, I was in the Maasai Mara many years ago when I went to Kenya. We went down into the Maasai Mara and we were in a Jeep and we were told, don't get out of this Jeep, whatever you do. Um, you are in the zoo, you are in their habitat, don't get out of the zoo. And I remember one, right before I left the house, Larry was a teenager and a young teenager. And right before I left the house and, and we went to the airport, he said, dad, promise me one thing. I said, you name it. He said, bring me a lion's tooth. <laughs> and I said, if there's one laying around on the ground, I'll get it for you. But I want to tell you, I, I'm not going to go try to find a lion uh, to get you a tooth. Lions weigh an average of 500 pounds. They run uh, 35 miles an hour, can leap 30 feet into the air. They have fangs and claws. Where we lived in South Florida and grew up, they had the Lion Country Safari. I don't know if you've ever been to Florida and you've driven through the Lion Country Safari, a bunch of lazy lions laying around. They feed them all the time. Fleas laying on them, flies lay on them. They come and lay on your car and look at you like, why are you here? But I want to tell you, you don't dare get out of your car. You don't dare roll down your window. They may look lazy and they may look harmless, but they will hurt you in a heartbeat. Not long ago, uh, a man that worked in the zoo stuck his, trying to show off for some of his friends, stuck his finger through the gate where a lion resided, a man that worked in the zoo, and that lion bit his finger off. So the, these, when you run across a lion on a snowy day, it may be the last day of your life. It may be the last thing that you ever do, and especially when you run across something like that, you would immediately back away. You don't think about chasing a lion. You think about running from a lion. There's a movie that just recently came out. It's called The Beast. Have you seen it? Just the commercials of it are totally frightening, where a lion is trying to chase a family down. They, the family is the prey. Just watch it. I, I want to see it. Kay, there's no way Kay's going to go see that movie with me. So if you haven't seen it, maybe we can see it together. But there is, the whole thing is about, is about this lion chasing this family down. That's what lions do. They are not the prey. They are the ones that chase uh, the prey. Ben and I, by the way, would do something that probably would trace back, as I mentioned, um, to him getting, it, it looks pretty good on your resume that you killed a lion, you killed a massive Egyptian, you took a spear away and killed him with it. Um, when you read his resume, it's pretty impressive. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, you know, Solomon is writing by inspiration a book of Proverbs, and he says, when I was young, my father would tell me these things, and I believe David told him stories, and he would tell him stories of the mighty men. He obviously told him things that would be Proverbs, and so Solomon as a little boy would listen to the stories of David, but also Solomon as a little boy and as a teenager would know who guarded his dad, the man that guarded his dad, the bodyguard of his father, was Benaniah. He was the chief bodyguard. Benaniah was willing to exchange his life for David's life. He was willing to trade his life uh, in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, in any moment in order for David to survive. This is the kind of person that Benaniah is. Um, this is a, a fight or flight moment, isn't it? When you run across a lion and you chase them into a pit on a snowy day. And so are you gonna run away from those things that you're afraid of? Are you gonna run toward, Lieutenant Ted Anderson would run toward the roar of the flames. Um, it almost goes against anything inside of us to run towards something. And not a whole lot has changed over, I think, the course of 3,000 3, years. Um, I think there's some thing, big things that we need to do some big dreams that we need to have. Set big goals in your life. Now, I, th I think sometimes we've settled for plan B. We've stopped thinking big. We've stopped dreaming big because we think we serve a small God. It is not true. 
When I read about the mighty men and the courage they had, they knew the God they served and they knew the King of Israel and the God that he served. And one of the reasons that they could stand and have so much courage is because God would put in them that courage. You and I need to have more courage in our life. We need to stop living like we're just trying to get to death. We, we, we need to stop like we're just going to watch TV and hide in our houses and wait for death to come. You know, I, I don't know why we're, we're doing that. You know, we're just kind of getting through the day, you know, the best we can. You know, man, we need to, y'all, we need to use it up. What God gave us, you know, we, there's this li literally a stewardship in our life of all the gifts, all the potential, all the incredible things that God has given us, and we need to, to use it up. If you don't think that's a bad thing or, you know, that somehow hanging on and being safe is a good thing, then you need to go back and read the parable of the talents. Because the man that was given five used his five, the man that was given two used his two, but there was one who was given one and he buried it in the ground. He didn't do anything. You're saying, well, Harold, he didn't do anything bad. The, the Lord called him wicked and lazy. He took his talent and buried it in the ground. He didn't do anything with it, not anything. He didn't risk anything. He didn't try anything. And we need to stop living like our purpose in life is to arrive safely at death. I, I, so I want to ask you this morning, what's the scariest thing you could, you know, I think sometimes we, like, we're afraid to, to step out in faith anymore. We're, we're afraid to set goals, set, have some dreams and, and some things to, to maybe change up our life and put the past behind us and to attempt new things, great things for God. And w what would be the scariest thing that you would try to attempt? I don't you ask, answer that out loud. But what would be some big goal? And by the way, make sure it's big enough that when it's over and you've accomplished it, you can say, hey, the only way I did this is God did it. The only way that, that I accomplished this is God helped me accomplish this. Because if you can do it on your own, it's something you can do in a day or a couple of days. That's not much of a goal. I'm not talking about something like that. I'm talking about some big dream, some 500-pound lion in your life that maybe you need to go after and you need to have the courage uh, to, to, to do that. So, um, so there are two ways. There are actually two ways that you recognize some of the things that are in you, and a lot of it has to do with your history. A lot of it has to do with your past. Um, back to the story I used at the beginning of this lesson, Lieutenant Colonel Ted Anderson um, it, it kind of traces back to something that happened to him when he was 13 years old. When he was 13 years old, his dad was graduating from the FBI Academy in Quantico. And so he and his dad and his family would go to the Tomb of the Unknowns, and he would meet soldiers there, and he would watch soldiers. And at the age of 13, Lieutenant Ted Anderson, at the age of 13, told his dad, I want to be a soldier. When I grow up, I want to be a soldier. For two decades, Ted Anderson was a paratrooper. For two decades, he served in the United States military and finds himself in the Pentagon on that day those planes crashed. Dreams, by the way, are contagious. Ben is not serving his own dream. He's helping David become king. He's helping guard David. He's helping David be. When you read the exploits of the mighty men, these are men who have surrounded themselves with one of the biggest dreamers in all the world, and that's David. And by helping David reach his dream, they also reach their dreams along the way. I love the fact that Benaniah not only is his bodyguard, David's bodyguard, but later on, he must be fairly young because later on he would serve as the commander-in-chief of Solomon's army. Faith is a willingness, I don't know if you can read this or not, but faith is a willingness to look foolish. Um, sometimes it does, doesn't it? You know, when I, when I teach people the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and I tell them, hey, it's about repenting, it's about changing, giving your life to Jesus, it's about being baptized in Christ. It's almost immediately baptized. What do you mean baptized? I said, well, being baptized is you're, you're immersed in water, you're, you're dunked in water. That's what's a burial. The, the Bible calls it a burial. Well, that's, I don't know why you'd have to do that. It seems like a foolish thing to do. I've had people say that. It seems foolish. Folks, sometimes it's not about success or failure. It's about obedience. Sometimes doing what God wants you to do, may it, it may seem foolish. And when you read the Bible, you see that. Noah looked foolish building an ark. Uh, Sarah looked foolish buying maternity clothes. 
David looked foolish going into battle with his own giant, Goliath, with a slingshot of all things. Ben and I looked foolish chasing a lion. Wise men looked foolish following a star. Peter looked foolish getting out of a boat. But we know how it ends. Remember, we have that hindsight bias. So we know the story. Noah's saved from the flood. Not only is Noah saved from the flood, he saves his family from the flood. Sarah gives birth to Isaac. David defeats Goliath. Ben and I kills the lion. The wise men found the Messiah. I love that story. And Peter walks on the water. And some of you sitting here, you're saying, I don't even want to look foolish. I don't, I don't want to go to counseling. I don't want to be a better person. I don't want to change my major. I don't want to ask somebody for help. You know, I don't want to make this phone call because it makes me look foolish. And sometimes faith, stepping out of faith, it, it's putting yourself in a situation where you might look foolish, where you need help. And reaching out not only to the help of someone else, but especially the help of God is exactly what you need. People say it all the time, man, you, I, I don't want to look foolish. I, I don't want to look silly. Think about just how, um, uh, just how much you've accomplished, the little things you've accomplished in your life by looking foolish, right? And um, asking somebody out. You knew they were out of your league, right? And uh, when, it's funny, when I tell the story of meeting Kay and she tells the story of meeting me, it's two different stories. <laughs> because I'm a cool guy that walked into a clothing store and to her, I'm this really weird dude that had sunglasses hanging out of my mouth, you know. But I said, I'm going to ask her out, you know. I'm going to do this. I, I, I worked as a police officer and I quit doing that the year um, that things were really going well for me and I could have been promoted I quit and I went back to college and started doing something totally different and people said man you are foolish for doing this you're silly for doing this but sometimes faith is it's, it's stepping out you know we have all kinds of fears and we've got to overcome our fears and that's the second thing I want to talk to you is about overcoming our uh, our fears we, we run away from those things normally that we're afraid of. And by the way, if you start running away and you keep running away, you may be running away all of your life. If you run away from something that makes you uncomfortable, something that you're afraid of, a situation that, oh man, I don't know if I want to put myself in this situation, you'll be running away the rest of your life. I read not long ago that there are actually two fears that people are born with. You know what they are? I didn't, I didn't know this. It's the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Those two fears. People have those, they're born. And in fact, my grandson, even at four years old, if there's a loud noise, somebody drops a pot in a kitchen, he immediately covers his ears and he, he turns the other way. He's uh, very, very afraid of, of, of loud noises. And it's kind of funny because he's so risky in other areas of his life. Those two fears. Uh, scientists tell us we don't, we're born with those two fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. You know what that means? That means every other fear we have is learned. And if it's learned, it can be unlearned. I'm afraid of failure. I'm afraid of whatever it is confronting, whatever it is in my life. I'm afraid of something, and because I'm afraid of it, I don't run toward it, I run away from it. Um, someone has written that the, the cure for fear of failure isn't success. It is failure in small enough doses that you build up immunity to it. I like that. And that's true for our life. Is It's not about winning or losing or uh, success or failure in God's kingdom. It's about o obedience. I, I asked this years ago. I, I asked this question to this congregation. If you knew you couldn't fail, what dream would you go after? If you knew you couldn't fail, what dream would you go after? But maybe the better question is, if you knew you could fail or would fail, what dream would you go after anyway? Because it's, it's that important that you couldn't live without going after it. So, so live to tell the story and, um, and it'll be a great story. I can almost imagine David telling Solomon bedtime stories and telling them about the lion. 
Every time we go to a, the Denver Zoo, my grandsons say to Kay and I, Ma, Ma, Mama Kay, that's what they call Kay, Mama Kay, Papa, you remember the lion? You remember the lion? And one day when we went into the zoo, we could hear the lion roaring. You can hear a lion's roar from five miles away. You could hear the lion. He was standing on a rock. And uh, even though he was caged in that zoo, man, it was so majestic and, and so, so powerful. Forty years later, Solomon would become, uh, Solomon would make Benaniah the, the chief and commander of his, his army. There's, a, there's some psychologists, one last thing, I'll be done. There's some psychologists a couple of decades ago, so, sociologists actually, Tom Gilvich and, and uh, Victoria Medvik. And they started doing uh, this study, and they were trying to make a distinction between the kinds of regrets that we have. And there's a regret called action regrets, that we do things that we really regret. Have you ever done that? Yeah, you're not being honest if you didn't nod, nod your head yes. Because all of us have things. We've done things and said things, and like, oh, man, they're cringeworthy, right? Even as we think about them now, we're like, Oh, man, I regret that. I regret doing that. I regret saying that. And so there are those kinds of regrets. And then there are inaction regrets. Those are the regrets of things that we didn't do, that we should have done. They were opportunities that were put in front of us, and we instead, um, we instead took a different path. What they discovered was in the short term, we regret actions over inactions. In other words, uh, today, we have those cringeworthy moments. It's something like 53 to 47. It's kind of a toss-up. But over time, the inactions become 84% over 16. In other words, when it comes to the end of our life, when it comes to the time when we're dying and we're older and we don't have a lot of time left, we're going to regret the lions we didn't chase. Neil Rose said it this way, he said, when we look back on our lives as a whole, we are most haunted by things left undone, maybe romantic opportunities, untried, career changes, unexplored, friendships left unattended. I think we've let our fears di dictate um, our decisions, and uh, we can't keep running away from things that we're just a little bit afraid of. So quit living as if your purpose in life is to arrive safely at death. Set some goals in your life. There, even right now, I don't care how old you are, you are able enough to get here this morning. In your life right now, you can set some God-sized goals in your life and pursue God-given passions that you have. Go after dreams that you couldn't accomplish without God's intervention in those dreams. That you know at the end of the day, he helped you accomplish it. He saw you through to the other side. Stop pointing out problems. Anybody can do that. That's part of the hindsight bias, by the way. We want to show the problems that all the football players had yesterday. Point out some solutions. Stop talking about what went wrong. Stop, start talking about what can happen to build something better. Stop repeating the past. Stop, start creating the future. Face your fears. Fight for your dreams. Um, burn sinful bridges that are in your life right now. Blaze new trails, live for the applause of nail scarred hands. Don't let what's wrong with you keep you from worshiping what's right with God. Dare to fail, dare to be different, quit holding out and quit holding back. What a good song for us to sing this morning, Living by Faith. This is a great song. In fact, the last verse of that song says, I know that he will safely carry me through no matter what evils betide. Why should I care though the tempest may blow if Jesus walks close by my side? With him we have everything and with him we have absolutely nothing. And so I want to encourage you that you'll take a chance today, take a risk, take advantage of this opportunity to give your life to Jesus once and for all. That you will confess him as the Lord of your life that you will put your past behind you, that you will be baptized into Christ regardless of how foolish that may seem to you, 
because it identifies with the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And it's not about success for failure. It is about obedience. It's about what doing what God wants you to do and doing it today and doing it tomorrow and doing it the next day. And then you'll be raised to walk in newness of life. You know what God will do? You'll, be, you, you'll, you'll have a greater position than bodyguard of a king. You're going to have a greater position, by the way, than the military leader or commander of some kind of army. The Bible says that you will become God's child, his son, his daughter, that your name will be added to the Lamb's book of life, that your sins will be washed away, totally, totally washed away, that you will be raised to walk in a brand new life. And have the courage to do that today. If you'll start with that one act, if you'll start with this one act of courage, I believe God will begin to change your life, and he will change it literally today for all eternity. But do it today. Seize the opportunity that's available to you today. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but we know we have right this moment, we have this time right now. Tom's going to lead us in living by faith. I'll be here at the front, and Elder will be with me. If we can help you in any way, you come while we stand and sing the song of encouragement. Dave Skill wanted me to offer a, a prayer for his uh, daughter Mandy and uh, what's going on with her. We have mentioned Mandy, you know, she's been on our prayer list. She's still in the hospital. She's been moved out of ICU to a room. She's uh, not going to go home. Um, she's uh, terminal, and the doctors um, are uh, making her comfortable. Um, her sister did get um, granted the care, legally the care of her which is a good thing, but she has a boyfriend that's not a very positive uh, influence, I think, that's trying to remove her from the hospital. And um, he just wanted us to pray for that, uh, that whole situation. So, um, and also, uh, Buck wanted me to pray for his, um, his brother-in-law's family and uh, his uh, brother-in-law's uh, father, uh, brother-in-law's father, right? And... Um, uh, 
uh, took his life the other night. He'd been struggling with dementia. His wife was asking him a bunch of questions. He couldn't answer them and was kept forgetting. And it just frustrated him so much. And so, uh, so please uh, pray for that family. Uh, I, I know the loss of, of something like that, and it's, it's, uh, it's difficult. You know, you're embarrassed by that happening. And at the same time, and, you know, somebody is struggling. They're in a lot of pain. And uh, so our, our hearts and, and uh, uh, a lot of compassion goes out to them. So we want to uh, pray for them this morning. Lord, we're grateful today for your love for each and every one of us. We're mindful of these situations and, and uh, the, uh, that we know you're there with them. We know that you'll not leave them alone, that you'll never forsake them, and that you're with these families. You're with Mandy there in that hospital. and pray that you'll protect her and watch over and help her, Lord. Even in her situation there in the hospital, it'll be like the have a prodigal son moment where she'll uh, see clearly and come to her senses and turn to you and want to come home to you. And um, ask that you help Stephanie stay strong and, and, uh, and keep uh, someone or anything that might uh, take her away uh, or harm her in any way. Uh, watch over her and, uh, and uh, these, these families. We're grateful, Lord for uh, your love for us and it is a reminder of our broken world how the hurt of all that all of us endure and and uh, we we see every day and uh, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world we know lord our best days are ahead of us that you've overcome the world and uh, we have victory because of you and through you and we're so grateful for that today in jesus name amen I'd like to share a note with you from our Kathy Brown. Kathy says, will you please say a prayer of thanksgiving to God for the good outcome for the thyroid biopsy? The menagerie was benign. Amen. 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 Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this positive good news that Kathy has received. We pray that you continue to bless her and be with her, and we know that you are in control. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. When we meet in sweet communion, where the feast divine is spread, hearts are brought While partaking of the bread, precious feast all else surpassing, wondrous love for you and me. While we feast, Christ gently whispers, do this in Surpassing wondrous love for you and me while we feast Christ gently whispers do this in my memory feast divine all else surpassing friends. 
Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we all also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God and God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. That's from 1 John 4, 7 through 16. These are the words from the Apostle John who saw God, who saw Jesus in the flesh, and testified that he is the Savior of the world. And now at this time, let's go together. And let's remember the sacrifice that our God made for us, that he was willing to give up his only son to be our sacrificial lamb so that we could be saved from our sins. Let's pray together. Most righteous Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the blessings we enjoy. Watch over us, dear Lord. Take care of us. But at this time, dear Lord, we come before your throne of grace, taking of the bread, dear Lord, which represents your son's body, which was given on the cross of Calvary for us, his body given for our salvation. Let us do so now. Take it in a manner pleasing in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. like manner Jesus gave us the, through the vine to represent the blood his blood without the shedding of blood there's no forgiveness of sins and we come together to remember that every Lord's Day as members of this church let's go to God in prayer dear only father again we come before your throne we know that blood was given that we could be forgiven we ask dear Lord that you watch over us that you take care of us help us to take this fruit of the vine remembering the sacrifice at the end in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> At this time during our worship service, we take a moment to think about giving so that the cause of Christ can be proclaimed to the world from this congregation as we're supposed to do. We're supposed to tell others about Jesus and his sacrifice and the good news of Jesus Christ and his salvation is only through him. There are different ways to give. We mentioned we're not going to pass the plate. There's boxes in the back. There's ways online that you can give, but the point is to give with a cheerful heart. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much. You bless us. You bless this congregation with so many things. You watch over us and you take care of us every day. Many times, dear Lord, we look back and go, God, you took care of me and I didn't even have a clue. And help us now, dear Lord, to give back to you, 
cheerfully, with a, with, with a grateful attitude, knowing that you take care of us. And we pray that you watch over these funds, those that make the decisions over them, that the cause of Christ will be proclaimed in our mission field. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we're grateful that you're here this morning worshiping with us. Uh, I was sitting there thinking uh, we have a good crowd this morning. I wish you could experience from my point of view, Moises knows this, when you have a lot of people here, the singing is really, really good. I, um, so thank you guys for singing out today. Um, I want to echo what Harold said. Um, we have two groups combined today, uh, Scott and I's group and Harold and Buck's group. And we're going to be meeting next door. We prepared a bunch of food. And we didn't prepare that for us. We prepared that for you. If you're visiting with us or if you're not in a small group yet and would like to come and meet and just find out a little bit more about what that's about, we would love to have you come next door. Leftovers are great, but I don't want to take leftovers home today. So please, if you're visiting, come, come, come share a meal with us. Um, we would really enjoy having you over there to do that. So let's stand together. We're going to sing uh, Jesus Loves Me as our closing song. Jesus loves me, this I know. actually read the words up there thankful for I'm thankful that you asked me to uh, lead the prayer this morning so if you'll bow with me please dear God Lord Father and Savior in heaven we're thankful so much for your son who was crucified on the cross that was a cruel uh, death if you look at the biblical uh, account and also if you look at this historical account of how they uh, went about crucifying someone it was it was a horrible way to have to die and uh, of course we're glad that we have the salvation through Jesus we're thankful that we, it's a simple plan of believing seeing what hearing what we uh, the story deciding to believe the story repenting being willing to confess and to confess and also to be buried with him in baptism, raised to walk and you have a new life. Uh, also, Lord, we are thankful for the food, clothing and housing that you provide us with. We're thankful for family. Uh, uh, I pray that as a grandfather, we could be a better example for the grandkids and uh, we are very blessed to have a nice family, uh, all of our in-laws and <coughs> all their parents are God-fearing people, and we all have
had the same goal, to be in heaven. Uh, also thankful, watch over us uh, spiritually, financially, emotionally, physically, and mentally. Uh, pray that we'll each one be able to take time to stop and examine our lives, all the aspects of it, and see where we might be failing so that we can improve those things. And in my, from my own standpoint, <clears throat> I want to be able to stop and think before I speak. So, uh, do the self-examination, each one of us. Be with us through the rest of this week. Forgive us of our sins and keep us safe. In Jesus' name. We have just a few family announcements I want to share with you this morning. Reminder, ladies' retreat is this coming Friday and Saturday. There's a printout in the back tables about the, for those that are going. If you have any questions or need any assistance, see Melinda Brown or Lynn, Lynette Chupp. And they will be in the fellowship hall next door. Uh, we have several on our sick list we want to remind everyone to be praying for. Roger Beecham is in North Georgia Regional Hospital with a low kidney function. Peggy Beecham has a PET scan on the 23rd of this week. She wants prayers for good, she solicits prayers for good results. Jackie Travis's mother, Sadie Young, is home with Jackie now and her health is declining and we want to pray for her. Also, we received word that uh, Phyllis ne Neely got a positive result non-aggressive uh, from a biopsy that she had, and she'll be doing short treatment shortly. Also, Cindy Hamilton, who we recently prayed for, is having surgery on the 28th to replace her aorta valve. In case you missed the announcement, we're having a luncheon next door, okay? <laughs> and you weren't paying attention the first two times, we're having a luncheon next door. We'd love to have you come, and vi if you're visiting with us, to come and join us next door and give us an opportunity to get to know you. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had this morning to come together to worship you, remember the sacrifice that you and your son made for each one of us. Father, we pray that for those that we just mentioned that are sick and hurting, I pray for Roger Beecham, I pray for Peggy Beecham, I ask that you be with Jackie Travis, Phyllis Neely, and Cindy Hamilton. I pray you watch over and take care of them. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you all.